Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Tuesday, June 26th. A tremendous success, a tremendous victory for the American people. The Supreme Court utterly failed. Reaction to today's ruling upholding the president's travel ban. I would describe the teacher shortage in Chicago as somewhat of a manufactured crisis. How Chicago's teacher shortage is different from a shortage of teachers downstate. We now are actually being visited by many jails and large jails throughout the country looking at our model of care. An exclusive look into the medical center at the Cook County Jail and why a decade of federal oversight is ending today. Pulitzer Prize winning architecture critic Blair Kamen on the billion dollar proposal to upgrade Chicago's Union Station. Look at all of our dreams gone to dust. The this year's National Youth Poet Laureate hails from Chicago. We meet Patricia Frazier. But we didn't invent close-up magic. What we did was invent where close-up magic was performed. Up close with Chicago-style magic in a North Side speakeasy. And in viewer feedback, your comments about Cardinal Supich's stance on family separation and immigration issues. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. A mayoral candidate says the city isn't doing enough to address potential hazards to the water supply. Amanda Vinicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Phil, Chicago is in the process of replacing water service lines, something mayoral candidate Paul Vallis says is needed. Problem is, he says, that work can stir up dangerous contaminants like lead, which can leach into drinking water. Vallis says Mayor Rahm Emanuel's administration is doing nothing about it. What is absolutely clear and undeniable is that, that we have lead in the water, and we have lead in the water of too many homes, even without, even without main replacement. And secondly, that the replacement of the water mains contaminates, contaminates the water even more. So what are you going to do about it? Fallis is calling for testing wherever water mains are replaced. He also proposes using fees, a tax credit, or grants to help schools and low-income residents pay for filtration systems. He offered no cost estimate. Emanuel's office criticized Vallis for inciting panic and says corrosion control measures are taken when replacing water mains. Another candidate, Gary McCarthy, is accusing Emanuel of turning a blind eye to violence. McCarthy says Emanuel tries to distract voters from crime and scandals. Meanwhile, Emanuel today drawing attention to an upcoming hike in the minimum wage. Workers within city limits will be paid at least $12 an hour starting July 1st. No parent who works full time should raise a child in poverty. That should be a basic. Next year, the minimum wage in Chicago will rise to $13 an hour. The bumps are thanks to an ordinance passed back in 2014. Efforts to raise the statewide minimum wage from $8.25 have stalled. The federal government is sending Illinois $4 million to offset costs of renovations at the state veterans home in downstate Quincy, which has been plagued by outbreaks of Legionnaire's disease. That's a waterborne illness. The federal funding is a drop in the bucket. Governor Bruce Rauner's administration wants to spend upwards of $240 million to build a brand new facility. The new state budget, which takes effect on Sunday, puts in about $50 million to get started. Illinois could see more federal money come its way for the project. Congressman Mike Quigley gave a speech on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives today, paying tribute to Chicago Tonight's own Elizabeth Brackett, who died just over a week ago. She was a role model and a force for truth. We will all miss her expertise and energy, both in and out of the news studio. Quigley says now more than ever, it's important to recognize the critical role of a free press in our democracy. As for the weather, showers and thunderstorms overnight with a low around 68. Then tomorrow, a slight chance of showers and thunderstorms, otherwise mostly cloudy with a high near 79. And don't forget, you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook via podcast and the PBS video app, as well as online at WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight. 
After the break, Phil Ponce and his guests look at the Supreme Court's decision on President Trump's travel ban. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. There's a shortage of women in STEM because there aren't enough opportunities. ComEd wants to change that, one program at a time. Celebrating Women's History Month with the Icebox Derby. Building confidence, building bright minds, building the workforce of the future. The Supreme Court today upheld an order restricting travel to the U.S. from several majority Muslim nations. Protesters rallied outside the court this morning. Opponents of the ban argue it's unconstitutional and that the president's comments and tweets show it is motivated by anti-Muslim bias. Writing for the five justice majority, Chief Justice John Roberts said, while plaintiffs argue that this president's words strike at fundamental standards of respect and tolerance in violation of our constitutional tradition, the issue before us is not whether to denounce the statements. Joining us to share their thoughts on today's decision, our longtime immigration attorney, Kalman Resnick, Ahmad Rahab, he is the executive director of the Chicago office of the Council on American Islamic Relations, Joe Morris, a partner at the law firm Morris & De La Rosa, he served as an assistant attorney general in the Reagan administration, and attorney John Giocaris, a member of the Chicago Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. And gentlemen, thank you for being here. We very much appreciate it. Uh, Joe, I'm going to ask you to do an exercise which you did in law school, and that is give us a brief statement of the case. If, the president, if, if a candidate for the office of President of the United States says intemperate, even bigoted things, do those statements operate to restrict or diminish the powers of the presidency under the Constitution? Uh, Calvin, do you, uh, Resnick, do you agree with that statement of the case? Is that no, how you see I, it? I don't think that's what the statement, uh, accurate statement of the case. What the case decided, one, was uh, a preliminary injunction granted by the Ninth Circuit prohibiting the enforcement of the Muslim ban uh, was reversed. The court found that it did not violate the statutes or the constitutional prohibition against uh, in the First Amendment on the establishment of religion, favoring one religion over another. And uh, John G. Karras, uh, regardless of how the case is stated, what was your reaction to the Supreme Court's decision? It actually didn't surprise me much at all. In fact, uh, the, the, um, the INA, which uh, grants powers to the president uh, in terms of uh, who he can decide, uh, citizens and, and non-citizens and immigrants uh, coming into the country uh, grants the president wide latitude uh, and powers. In fact, if you inspect the uh, language of the statute, they're pretty broad. And that's why the Supreme Court historically has granted the president wide latitude uh, in terms of immigration and border security. And in that sense, uh, the court essentially reaffirmed it, despite you know, some of the president's more colorful remarks when you know, he said, uh, we're going to have a total and complete shutdown of Muslims coming into the United States. While it was certainly, um, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it certainly gr uh, got the justices' attention, uh, strictly speaking, examining the text of the uh, executive order, it indeed was constitutional. Uh, Ahmed uh, Rehab, uh, ignoring uh, John G. R. Harris's uh, outstanding, uh, outstanding invitation to press. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What was your reaction to the Supreme Court's decision? It was one of disappointment, and, and I don't think we can talk about the decision or the executive order itself in a vacuum. We need to hearken back to the context of this entire process. The first time we heard about this was when, per your invitation, it was on the campaign trail in which the president uh, nominee himself at the time said that it is about a Muslim ban, that he wants to ban Muslims from entering the United States. That's in terms of intention, and that was mentioned several times if you want to peer into the heart of Donald Trump, just look at his Twitter feed. That's where it all comes out. But then also we need to look at consequences. So intention is there. The consequences are as such. First, who is being affected? Innocent individuals, and we deal with them, our clients, families from the Middle East who have, have nothing in their history that is remotely close to national security concerns. And who is not affected? Terrorists and those who might be a problem for our national security. Zero convictions have happened the last time we had a special Muslim registration. Uh, Joe Morris, uh, in her dissent, Justice Sotomayor said, uh, called this a discriminatory policy motivated by animosity towards Muslim. Uh, your response to the policy, to the argument that the president's statement so colored the context 
of the enforcement of this statute that it was discriminatory. Well, I don't think that was the president's intention. I think there's something important to dis distinguish between discrimination against a, 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 a religion or people who are members of religion on the one hand and people coming from a nation which is in some way dangerous to the United States, that is, it poses a threat to the national security of the United States, it's inevitable that people in some other country are going to belong to some religion or some ethnic group. And if we, if we throw up any barrier all the way up to a declaration of war against that nation because it poses a threat to the United States, it's simply wrong to say that we're doing that because of their religion or their ethnic background. Calvin, does that, uh, does, that, uh, does that really... Does that really uh, accurately reflect what was happening here, the fact that that uh, if you come from a country, you're bound to be some religion, that it was religion neutral. No, I don't believe this was religiously neutral. I believe this, the animus for this was the president and his advisors' decision during the campaign to campaign for a Muslim ban, and after he was elected, announced they were going to do that, and this is the first step towards implementing that campaign promise. It is a an anti-Islamic animus. I believe that Sotomayor got it right when she, in her dissent, called it what it is, an impermissible discriminatory animus against Islam and its followers. And this is a matter of concern to all Americans, not just to Muslims. How come? Because we are all vulnerable. I'm a Jewish American. There are Buddhist Americans, Hindu Americans. But there you're are an American Christian citizen. Americans. It affects us. If I want to marry someone from outside the United States and bring them here and they're from a country that cannot, uh, you, I cannot bring the person here, that's a problem for all of us. This is happening to Muslims from these countries, five mu Muslim majority countries. It can happen to more Muslims. I believe it will happen to more Muslims because this decision endangers our freedoms here. Today, Muslim Americans cannot marry someone from one of these five countries and bring that person to the United States. John G. Karras, how about that? Uh, might, this, might the impact of this ruling affect uh, Muslims from countries other than the five nations that uh, were part of this uh, executive order? Not at all, and I think that's a critical distinction. Uh, the fact that, uh, first of all, a lot of people mistakenly believe that this bans all Muslims from coming. Certainly it, it doesn't. In fact, the, the original executive order uh, contained eight countries, uh, and, and three countries of which have since been removed, Iraq, Chad, and Sudan, specifically for complying with the order in improving their practices in terms of vetting uh, 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 or non-citizens rather who come over. Of the five remaining countries, which I believe are Iran, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, and Libya, uh, the court essentially said that there is a, a uh, fundamental and um, clear um, reason for doing this, which is uh, simply to you know, vet those, those specific countries that have been identified by Congress and prior administrations, both Democrat and Republican, as be, uh, posing high national security risks. Uh, Ahmed Raham, one of the things that, point, uh, that I, uh, Justice Roberts pointed out was that uh, notwithstanding this ban, that it's possible for some citizens from each of those countries to continue to come to this country. Do you buy that? It might be, but it doesn't change the larger conversation, that what we are seeing is an implementation, an attempt to funnel in what is a Muslim ban through the court review system, and that's why we've seen these iterations of the Muslim bans. There have been 11 attempts to bring this before the courts, 11 times it's been shot down. We have seen a 40 percent decrease in the number of Muslim refugees entering this country for those who say it's not a Muslim ban. Those who have been banned from coming are students, professionals, there was an Oscar nominee who couldn't come here and receive his Oscar, he ended up winning the award. Um, people are coming for medical reasons, for weddings, for funerals, for investment professionals, etc. So it is affecting immigration into this country and tourism and visits into this country and not helping our national security one bit. Joe Morris, one of the things that uh, Justice Sotomayor also said in her dissent with that was that, quote, history will not look kindly on the court's decision today, nor should it. Uh, is there a possibility that this will be uh, this will be viewed by future generations along the lines of the Supreme Court decision which uh, basically gave approval to FDR and the uh, internment camps of Japanese Americans? I hope so. I truly hope so, Phil. I think this, but you I, hope that I, it will I, be viewed I, negatively I, in no, history? No, no. I, I hope that this will, be, this will be held up to history as a reversal 
of that sorry sp event in American history, one of the most sordid things that ha ever happened in American history. The decision was Korematsu versus the United States, where Japanese Americans sued the Supreme Court of the United States looking for relief from being rounded up by the President of the United States. Yes, but Justice Roosevelt. Sotomayor said there, uh, in her view, and there Chief was no Justice, distinction. And Chief Justice Roberts said she was wrong, and, and, and Korematsu versus the United States was wrongly decided. He said that today. Indeed. He said it was a stretch of presidential power. That's the issue here. The issue is what powers are confided to the president by the Constitution and the statutes. He said, he said this statute exudes deference to the president in terms of controlling borders for purposes of national security, but it doesn't permit the president of the United States willy-nilly to round up citizens and crowd them into concentration camps. And the Supreme Court of the United States, for the first time in history, said Korematsu versus the United States was wrongly decided and expressly overruled it. Page 38 of the slip opinion, people should, should read it. It quotes uh, the dissent of Justice Jackson in Korematsu versus the United States, now making that the law of our land. Today's decision was a blow, both in favor of reading the Constitution properly and protecting civil liberties. Any difference, Kalman Resnick, between today's decision and the decision uh, giving legal, legal cover to the Japanese camps? I think we're on a very slippery slope in our country when we allow for this Muslim ban to be approved by the U.S. Supreme Court. It endangers our freedom as a society. It makes all of us who are religious minorities vulnerable, and it exposes our country to the possibilities of horrific discriminatory laws that in use of executive power based on religion. It's horrific. Phil, think about what this executive order is saying. It's saying that your level of threat as an individual is not based on any individual action or anything in your, in your individual profile, but merely on where you happen to be born. And in That's which society you happen it's, to be it's born. Where you're trying to come from where you're trying to come to the United it's, States it's saying the same and thing. what cooperation we get from the governments of those countries in terms of ensuring that Terrorists don't infiltrate themselves in the United States, masquerading as the kind of innocent innocence uh, that Ahmed is, is describing. Indeed, and that's why the right. three countries were removed from the list, because those governments changed their vetting practices and were thus removed. That's the, it only affects five countries, which Roberts noted is only about 8% of the world Muslim population. And the only problem uh, with that is that there's been zero evidence that this has worked to make us safer. Zero evidence, and I challenge anyone to provide any evidence that this has made us any safer. All it's done is prevented good individuals from entering this country for all the right reasons. Does, uh, does the majority have a point, though, that the countries that uh, are affected by this order are not very good at vetting who comes to this country? We're very good at vetting who comes to this country. We have active programs, the best in the world, that are working and eliminate people from coming here who shouldn't be coming here because they're a danger. It is not good for the United States not to stand up for its values as a society and its values as a place for religious freedom. That weakens us as a country. Okay, Calvin, would you expand a little bit on something you've already alluded to, and that is the difference between the rights of a citizen and the rights of people who are trying to come to this country. How do you see that? The people who are being prevented from coming here are the relatives, the immediate family members of people who are U.S. citizens. We have, I have clients who are U.S. citizens who want to bring their elderly parents to the United States to join them. They can't. I have clients who are U.S. citizens and are married to people from one of the five Muslim majority countries. They can't come to the United States. I have people engaged to marry people who want to come to the United States. They are being banned from the United States. Joe Morris, the difference between uh, the rights that citizens have and the rights that immigrants have, generally speaking? Well, they're profound. Uh, and and the, the, the court today makes it clear that the rights of people outside the United States are very much subject to the restraints imposed by the Constitution and by Congress. And where the power that's conferred on the president to control the borders comes both from constitutional authority and from express grants of power by Congress, the power of the president is at a maximum, and that's where it should be in order to protect the United States, but particularly in an age when our enemies are not conveniently wearing uniforms and marching in ways we can identify them and connect them with some foreign office b back home so we can negotiate, but they're people who secretly come into the country in order to do harm to civilian Americans because they hate them. Do you hear, though, the other side, though, given the context, given the statements that the president made on the campaign trail, and since then, do you understand why people would take this as a policy based on, anti, uh, on discriminatory animus? Of, of course I do, and, and I, I can't for a moment uh, defend uh, the kind of rhetoric that calls into question the constitutional power of the president. The pres the, president Trump, in a way, because of, of the rhetoric that uh, John here was very, very cleverly mimicking, 
uh, called into question the powers of the President of the United States in a way that was really unfortunate and dangerous. Fortunately, the Supreme Court of the United States, cool heads prevail. I'm astonished the cool heads didn't prevail nine to nothing, but at least a majority of the Supreme Court got it right. Uh, Ahmed Rahman, we're almost out of time. I'll give you the last word. Closing thoughts. Again, rhetorically, this says one thing. The facts on the ground says another. When you look at a 77-year-old woman who is barred, banned from entering this country because of where she was born for no other reason, she's here or trying to come here for a life-saving operation. We're told it's because she wasn't vetted appropriately. Supposedly, we don't have the means to vet her appropriately. She's a threat. She hates America, that kind of thing. What we're seeing today is not divorced from what we're seeing at the borders down south, from the children that are being pulled from their families. Both, both uh, uh, executive orders, essentially, or both plans were, were architected by the same individual, Stephen Miller. Look him up and look at his ideology. That's where we're going to have to leave it. Kelman Resnick, Ahmed Rahab, Joe Morris, and John Giaparis. Thank you all for being here. Very much appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. All. And there's more Chicago tonight ahead, so please stay with us. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, a rare look inside the medical center that treats every single Cook County Jail detainee. Blair came in on the proposed radical billion dollar redevelopment of Union Station that would add hundreds of hotel rooms and apartments. The second ever National Youth Poet Laureate on how her memories of Chicago public housing inform her art. It is not a trick. Chicago-style bar magic is making a comeback in a North Side lounge. And your thoughts about the outspoken comments on immigration from Cardinal Blaise Supich on the show last week. But first, some Illinois school districts are waiting on Governor Rauner to sign a few bills they hope will alleviate a shortage of teachers. Statewide school districts reported more than 2,000 unfilled positions last school year, with 43% of those in Chicago public schools alone. Brandis Friedman has more now on what's been what's being done about this problem and Brandis what is CPS doing? So Phil at tomorrow's board meeting the district is recommending that the board designate about 16 teaching and staff positions what they're gonna call special needs positions so this means the district would be allowed to hire people for those jobs who do not live in the city limits and that is otherwise the policy for CPS um, for all other positions now the district did the same thing four years ago and while that may not necessarily be new they're doing it again because the problem hasn't changed none of the positions that were tough to hire for then have gotten any easier to fill. So there's a list on your screen that's all 16 of them. Now we're talking about some of the typical hard to hire positions like special education teachers and bilingual teachers, but also positions like language and STEM teachers, as well as nurses and counselors. The district says 80% of its empty positions come from this list of special needs positions. And about how many positions are at play here uh, in terms of those shortages in the district? Right, so the numbers from the State Board of Education, which issued a report on this earlier this year for the 2016-2017 school year, they show that CPS has 853 unfilled positions. That's 43% of all of the unfilled positions across the state. Now the biggest hole is for paraprofessionals like teaching assistants or aides and special education teachers. That's a close second. The district says it's working with colleges and universities that train teachers to encourage those future teachers to earn certification in special education. It's also working with foreign consulates to source language teachers. But in some cases, the district says there just aren't enough teachers being trained to meet the need. Physical education, for example. The handful of phys ed teacher training programs in the state only produce a couple of handfuls of phys ed teachers a year. And they're not enough to go around. Even hospitals have a nursing shortage, and they pay better than the school district. All that said, the Chicago Teachers Union argues that this shortage is manufactured. They say since its membership has been cut in recent years due to school closures and layoffs during the budget crisis. What's more, it says recent policies have exacerbated existing challenges with fully staffing the district. Um, we have a new teacher evaluation system, right, that kind of focuses on 
um, identifying supposedly bad teachers, but really ends up creating stress um, and pushes people out of the profession. We've had challenges in staffing because we have difficulties in our conditions, in our communities. We have neighborhoods that are disinvested in and schools where children come to school with a great amount of trauma. We don't actually provide the, the staff in the first place that um, is adequate to help those students, which drives um, retention to be a challenge. Baroness, how does this compare to the rest of the state? What are those bills? So statewide, the Board of Education believes that we're going to need an additional 20 to 24,000 educators through the year 2020. And that accounts, Phil, for the projected declines in K-12 through enrollment. I spoke with also a regional school superintendent for Northern Cook County who explains that the districts in our area don't experience the teacher shortage in the same way that many district, downstate districts experience it. Therefore, several of the bills that are on the governor's desk right now wouldn't make much of a difference for districts in our area. One of them, for example, would create a minimum teacher salary of $40,000. Well, here in Chicago, the base pay already begins at just over $50,000. The case may be somewhat different for charters that are not unionized, but that, again, is just a fraction of schools. Another bill would allow licensed out-of-state teachers to teach in Illinois without meeting additional requirements. One problem many districts do share, though, is finding enough substitute teachers. Now, there's legislation that would allow retired teachers to pick up more hours, and also it would create a short-term license for subs with a certain amount of training. Some of these bills were sent to the governor in late May to mid-June, and he has 60 days to sign them. Brandis, thank you. Jail inmates are among the few groups of citizens with a constitutional right to health care. As a result, a full-fledged medical center is housed within the Cook County Jail. It is responsible for the treatment of the six to 7,000 detainees that are there on a daily basis. That medical center operated for the last eight years under supervision of the federal government because of inadequate care. But that supervision ends today, and Cook County health officials say they are now a model for the rest of the country. Parrish Schutz has an exclusive look inside. Right behind these walls is the Sally Port, where all the buses come from in from the courthouses. Health officials almost never let reporters into their facility within the Cook County Jail for fear of breaching doctor-patient confidentiality. Their patients are the thousands of people who have been arrested and are incarcerated at the jail awaiting trial. Many of them come to jail without having adequate health care. They're vulnerable for substance use disorder and withdrawal, mental illness, and many chronic illnesses that may not have been addressed in the community. Dr. Connie Manella is the chief doctor of CIRMAC Health Services that runs the facility in jail. It's a division of the Cook County Health and Hospital System. She says that many of the detainees come in not knowing that they can get health coverage. 80% of people who come into the jail are eligible for Medicaid coverage, and many are not aware that they may be covered or they are in fact already covered, and they just need a little bit um, more assistance to get them through that process. She says health care screeners have signed up thousands of inmates so they can be covered when they get out. We're really trying to increase their health literacy. We're trying to show them these are the steps um, to take in order to be covered. Because our, our care is not just while they are in custody. We want to be able to help them transition back into the community. CIRMAC resembles any other medical clinic with doctors, nurses, exam rooms in every jail division, and a fully functional pharmacy. In 2010, the jail entered in a consent decree with the federal government after reports of inadequate treatment and staffing levels. That consent decree ends today, and Cook County health officials say they are now a model for other jails. We now are actually being visited by many jails and large jails throughout the country looking at our model of care because we really have um, worked on even going beyond the basics of what the um, federal government said we needed to do. A startling number of inmates are coming in with opioid addictions, and this is the first time they've received substance abuse treatment. It presents the daunting question, what happens to their addiction when they leave? So literally in the intake process, we will begin that conversation. We may say, what are your plans when you're released from custody? Do you have a primary care provider? Are you involved in a substance use treatment program? And we will print right off the computers different facilities where they can go when they leave here. Also upon discharge, detainees are given kits and training from CIRMAC pharmacists. 
on how to administer Narcan, a nasal spray, to anyone who has overdosed of heroin or any other opioid. CIRMAC health officials say that many detainees have used this spray to save the lives of family members or friends who have overdosed. It's a tool they give detainees in hopes that they not only stay out of jail, but continue to treat underlying illnesses. For Chicago Tonight, this is Paris Schutz. The CIRMAC Medical Center operates separately from the Cook County Sheriff's Office, the department that actually runs the jail. The center processes between 45 and 50,000 detainees per year at the jail's intake facility. Union Station is currently undergoing a major rehab, in case you hadn't noticed. Train passengers are already dealing with construction, but the interior work, including work on the Great Hall, is meant to be a major improvement to the crowded Union Station. More than 34 million Metro passengers and more than 3 million Amtrak passengers passed through Union Station last year. Now a new plan for a $1 billion redevelopment has just been announced. It would add 330 hotel rooms and 400 apartments on top of the existing building, completed in 1925. Here with that story and more is Blair Kamen, the Chicago Tribune's Pulitzer Prize winning architecture critic. And Blair, welcome back to Chicago tonight. Thank Quick you. question, I saw a picture in the paper that, uh, is it true that there are offices named for each of the Pulitzer Prize winning reporters at uh, the Tribune? That is true. Do you have one named after you? Uh, yes. Do you, is it your office? <laughs> I, I never go there. It's up, <laughs> it, no, it's a, it's a conference room, it's upstairs. and. Oh, yeah. come on. Haven't you taken a selfie in, outside of it? <laughs> no. okay. They only name things for people usually who are dead, so I, I sort of feel a little eerie about it. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's a good instinct. Well, yeah. let's talk about Union Station. <laughs> okay. uh, first of all, tell us about this proposal. We saw a picture of it. Right. Well, uh, the proposal is a major disappointment. Uh, it looks like uh, uh, an ice cube uh, has been popped on top of Union Station. Uh, this is the seven-story edition, the steel and glass edition that is this kind of squat modernist box being put on top of the uh, neoclassical pedestal. There it is. Uh, on Twitter today, I mean, the reaction against this was just, you know, people saying like it looked like a Schomburg office building was whipped up by a tornado and dropped on it very neatly on top of the uh, Union Station. Because you just referred to Union Station, the existing Union Station, as a pedestal. Correct. Which suggests what? Well, initially. To be built on top. Right, and uh, in 1925, when the station was supposedly completed, there were actually plans for a 20-story office building on top. It never got built, but that would have given a sense of completion to the existing station. Uh, because uh, this does look like something that was designed to have been a base for something that was taller. Yeah, uh, exactly. in Instead, you see it as what? I see it as it just It looks a like a base on top of a base. Uh, yeah, a base on top of a base or a... a um, a fishbowl that's kind of been dropped on top of the base. Um, you can see here the uh, the idea of the addition is to create this kind of s rectangular donut. Uh, it has a light cord in the center, and it's it's trying to respect the outlines and vertical proportions of the original Union Station. So it's uh, keeping the building. skylight portion of it open, right? Which is uh, about all it does mm. <laughs> in terms of. And in addition, you can see that the, uh, the, the, the areas in yellow here are the hotel rooms that would be built in the existing Union mm -hmm. Station. The green is the apartments. You can see how the architects have tried to create a little recess in those bottom green floors to try to create a separation between the old and the new, but uh, it really doesn't work uh, very well. The new is kind of a ponderous squat thing perched on top of the old. And um, there it is. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, as I said in the paper today, it uh, would bring all the grandeur of a holiday in to the forlorn but grand Union Station. Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, you wrote in Daniel Burnham speak, these plans are little, very little. Uh, more on, I mean, does it necessarily mean something super tall should have gone? No, in, in, by, in its by place? little, I just mean little in vision, little in imagination. These are conceptually weak. Um, they, they don't really, um, they're not calling, we're not calling for, I'm not calling for a super tall tower here. What I am calling for is something that has imagination and is appropriate to the site, and this isn't. To what extent do you think this, uh, this design is final? 
Well, I hope it isn't, but that's not really up to me. That's up to Alderman Brendan Riley, uh, the Alderman of the Downtown Ward in which Union Station is located. It's also up to Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who uh, has uh, control over the city's Landmarks Commission, which he appoints. And it's also, in a way, up to the citizens who live in Chicago. Union Station is a symbol of and a gateway to the city of Chicago. If people raise their voices and protest this, there's a chance that uh, public officials might hear them and demand something better. Let's move on to another uh, piece of property or that's uh, part of the built environment that's in play right now, the Harley Clark Mansion in Evanston. Tell us about this structure. Well, um, this is a 1927 Tudor Revival mansion on the lakefront in Evanston, just east of Sheridan Road. It's uh, right next to the lighthouse uh, in Evanston. It uh, has um, a beautiful exterior uh, with six monumental chimneys, a red tile roof, uh, all kinds of Tudor Revival detailing, beautiful pane windows, and it's been empty for three years since 19, uh, pardon me, since 2015, when the Evanston Art Center left for other quarters. So now the question is what to do with it? And there's a group of private citizens, who most of whom live nearby, who have proposed funding a demolition of this mansion. And but uh, their argument is that the, and, and my understanding, the city's argument is that it's in really bad shape. It's not, in and bad would take a lot of money to fix it up. Well, it's not in bad shape. Structurally, it is a sound building, according to respected engineers who have looked at it. It's a little down on the heels, but. You know, so was the Reliance building before it became the, the Hotel Burnham. Look, the estimate that this engineering firm said that it would take, the, the cost estimate, to get this building habitable and usable is only about $400,000. But not, the city of Evanston says it's a lot more when you factor for in. For a full-blown restoration. The question really here has to do with time. In other words, um, the idea is that, first of all, this is a building of great quality, as you could see from the videos. Uh, second of all, it's, um, we don't necessarily do full-blown restorations all at once. Often they're phased in. They happen, the key thing is to keep the building on life support, to, to spend that, say, $400,000 to fix it, and then to ultimately uh, create time for the city to come up with a development plan, either publicly funded or privately funded, that would allow the building to have a brighter future than it does today. Let's talk about a building that does seem to have a brighter, brighter, brighter future than it once did, the executive mansion. Uh, tell us about what the, ex uh, the governor's uh, home in Springfield uh, was facing and what it looks like now. Well, four years ago, this, the executive mansion was a wreck. Uh, there was uh, water pouring through the roof. Uh, you had uh, floorboards on the porch that were broken. Uh, you had plaster um, falling apart off the walls and coming down into the Lincoln bedroom. Uh, you know, balusters like this that looked that were in terrible shape. Oh my gosh! It look at that! Look at that one. Yeah, it was really, really in bad shape, and it was a metaphor in a way for the sorry mm. state of the state of Illinois. Um, more recently, though, scenes like this have disappeared as after a result of a um, $15 million renovation of the house uh, that was funded in part by Governor Rauner and his wife Diana. They kicked in a million dollars. The rest was privately raised. So um, all what this... What was done to it? Well... Pretty much we, everything? <laughs> uh, well, a lot. Uh, the exterior of the house was uh, rehabbed, beautiful articulation and detail was added that had been taken off, stripped off. The house was restored to a roughly year 1900 um, uh, identity. Uh, it was originally built in 1855, but um, it's, it was impossible to restore it to that year for complex reasons. So in general, the, um, the exterior of the house looks very handsome now, and the interior um, is far better than the shots. Well, here we are. Uh, you're, you're getting a sense of the, the magnificence of the house. The Chicago architects, Vinci Hamp, have restored beautiful salon rooms on the ground floor. There's an orientation room for visitors 
uh, pardon me, on the, uh, that, the orientation room was on the ground floor. The salon, uh, high ceiling Victorian rooms are on the main floor. And then on the third floor, there are beautiful period rooms that express key moments in the state's history, the Columbian Exposition, the Civil War. Um, it's a showplace again. And it's going to be open to the public. Correct, as of July 14th. Blair Kamen, thank you so much. Appreciate your thank insights. You, Good as to be always. here. And now to Carol Marine and the National Youth Poet Laureate. Carol. Patricia Frazier writes poetry was a message of empowerment, social activism, and remembrance. The 19-year-old Chicagoan was recently named the second ever National Youth Poet Laureate. The distinction is from a program created a decade ago by the literary arts organization Urban Word and the New York City Mayor's Office. In her forthcoming debut book, Graphite, Frazier draws inspiration from her upbringing in the now demolished Ida B. Wells homes in Bronzeville. And we welcome you to Chicago tonight. Thank you so much for having me. So National Youth Poet Laureate, that is a very big deal, isn't it? It's a huge deal, <laughs> definitely, yes. So when you were named in mm -hmm. April, mm -hmm. you said that you were shocked, that you cried, and that you gave a really bad speech. <laughs> yeah. Shall we deconstruct some of that? Why were you shocked? Um, just because every, well, first of all, we were competing with five different youth poet laureates from all over, New York, Chicago, L.A., Nashville, and Houston, and all of them were such phenomenal writers. I think it really could have went to any of us, um, but I was really just astonished that it was my story that got chosen. I think um, it's something that you dream about, like, doing when you're older. And for this to happen at such a young age to me was something I could have never imagined. Even when I made it to the finals of the competition, it was crazy. <laughs> so, Hence, really you shy. cried. Yes. <laughs> now, what was the really bad speech part of that? I didn't know I had to give a speech. I didn't expect <laughs> to win. Um, so I got up there, and I was just kind of like, thank you guys so much. And thank you guys. And it was basically that, me stumbling over you my You were words. overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed, definitely. It was something I didn't have enough time to come to terms with. When they announced my name, I sat in the seat for a minute, um, kind of just like, did they really just say me? So it was something I had to tackle within the next coming weeks. It wasn't something I could have given, prepared a good speech for the day of. There's plenty of time to make later. up for that. Yes. So <laughs> your upbringing came out of the Ida B. Wells homes, mm -hmm. right, in Bronzeville. Mm -hmm. And they no longer exist. Exactly, yeah. So your poetry is kind of a testament to what you can no longer see? Yeah. Um, so I think that I definitely want to investigate story. Um, and I think for so long when I was growing up in the Ida B. Wells homes, I didn't go outside because I was afraid to go outside. I was listening to the story of my neighborhood that was being told to me through a TV screen, right? So in the last year or so, when I got up the gumption to go and enjoy and appreciate the neighborhood, the next year was torn down, right? So when I finally, when you finally appreciate something and it's taken away from you, how do you, de how do you then cope with that? How do you decompress that? Um, and I think that my poems kind of I say this a lot, but they kind of serve as this like landmark or monument for something you can't go back to, right? If you were to Google my address and drive there, you would be driven to a field, a plain of trees. Um, so I definitely think that I just want my poetry to be that emblem for people who can't go back to their childhood homes. Who inspired you? Um, the matriarch of poetry, Gwendolyn Brooks, Miss Gwendolyn Brooks. I think she was always sort of thrown into my face, especially growing up in Bronzeville where she grew up and then going to the high school named after mm. her. It was just something that I could not get away from. Um, and a lot did of Did you her, try? I tried. I really did. I think that for a long time I didn't want to read poetry because I didn't want to read um, books that were about me or about people that looked like me. I only wanted to read sci-fi. I wanted to get away from my sort of reality. And Ms. Brooks writes about reality. She doesn't, like, you can't get away from it. Um, so I think I really started to appreciate her, um, especially when I heard a quote from her, which is that she writes about the things that she sees on her streets. When people say, where does she get her material from? She gets it from her streets. And I think that's sort of the same with me. Like, when people ask, where do you get your inspiration from? Why else would I write about anything other than what I see outside of my door every day that others don't um, and others don't appreciate? So I think that's definitely why I'm 
kind of compelled to her work. But you had to sort of grow into that ability yeah, to embrace that, definitely. right? Definitely. I had to grow into the ability to embrace her lineage and also um, understand what it really means to read a poem and connect to it and not just read a poem to say you read a poem, right? Like, what does it mean that I'm reading a Bronzeville mother burns bacon while in Mrs. Like, what does that mean that I'm reading this story about these two women who I know nothing about, but they also tell the story of where I come from? And what does it mean if I don't understand that, right? Or if somebody else from another neighborhood takes that as something other than what it is, right? I have to, I think it's our duty, like, to write about things at face value, even though they're painful. And I think that's what Ms. Brooks did. And I think that's sort of what I'm trying to do, but, and also at the same time, celebrate those things, right? I think that the narrative of a lot of artists is that we have to come from pain and that we have to come from struggle. Um, but my work is sort of just odes to things that people don't appreciate, right? Um, so I think that's definitely why I'm so drawn to Ms. Brooks' work. So at 19, you are working on your first book, mm -hmm. it's called Graphite, and is it fair to call it an ode to your grandmother? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Um, so my grandmother passed away a couple of months ago in September. That was actually the month I was named Chicago Youth, Chicago's Youth Poet Laureate. Um, so I think that Poet Laureateship was just a way to reconcile and heal, and I think that my grandmother's death kind of was the nail in the coffin of home, right? Like my grandmother was the person who always told me stories about where she came from and about um, living in Inglewood, about living in the South. Like, and once that's gone from me, I think that I had to figure out, okay, now it's time to create your story and re like recreate and give ode and pay homage to your grandmother's story, which got you here. Um, so yeah, my book is a big ode to her. It's an ode to the Wells. And it's really just about loss, coping with loss, um, but, more importantly, rebirth. Like, what can you become now that all of this has gone? Like, what will you learn from it? What will you take from the ashes? Do you have responsibilities as a National Youth Poet Laureate? Yeah, so um, I think mostly I'm going to be teaching a lot of workshops. I already do some of that work with Young Chicago authors. Um, I'm trying to work with Free Rights um, Arts and Literacy in the Juvenile Detention Center because I think that, well, the prison industrial complex is just something I'm super, super passionate about. Um, and I learned a about a lot of that work through my work with Asada's Daughters, which is another organization that I work with. Um, to put blankly, I'm an organizer, right? And I think that a lot of my work is inspired by my, organi my organizing. Like, how can I make more visceral the injustices that I, I see outside of my door? So there's how? activism in right. your soul mm -hmm. and yeah. in your poetry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that more so, first I want to illuminate and then celebrate. And I think that's always what my work is about. And I also think that's what organizing is about, right? It's the movement and the, pre the preparation for the protest or the sit-in or whatever. But it's also the afterwards. Like, it's also the building community. It's also the networking that comes from it. And I think that's super important, like, to always pair my writing and my activism hand in hand. Because without activism, my poetry probably wouldn't be much <laughs> to read. And on top of all of that, you are a Columbia College student, mm -hmm. rising sophomore yes. in creative writing and film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's been really great. I'm mostly trying to go into television, so it's really great to be here and like see how all this stuff works. Um, but yeah, it's not much to say on Columbia. I've only been there for a year. <laughs> well, that's all right. You've got, you've got a little time. It seems like you've used your time very I'm well. Trying. I'm trying to use it wisely. Well, and congratulations to you on this enormous honor on where you're going next. Thank you so much. So thank Patricia you. Frazier, thank you very much. And we look for your book when it comes out, Graphite. Thank you. Chicago Tonight is back right after this. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe. The city likes to add the Chicago style descriptor to a lot of things, pizza, hot dogs, American English. But did you know Chicago has its own style of magic too? Longtime Chicagoans might remember getting a little close up prestidigitation with their pint at the local watering hole. It's been decades since the last of Chicago's magic bars closed, but now a new venture in the Andersonville neighborhood has a few of Chicago's old tricks up its sleeve. 
Brandis Friedman recently brought us this story, and here is another look. Do you see the large black and white lines on the handkerchief? For Chicago Magic Lounge bar magician Jeff Bibbick, the magic bug bit early. When I was in the first grade, a magician came to our school and picked me out of the audience. And he had a little handkerchief and he made it into a little bag and he said, reach inside and whatever you find, you can keep. And when I pulled out my little hand, it was full of candy. So that's when I decided I wanted to be a magician. If you know magic, you can make all the candy you want. Now comes the important question. Are they going up and down or side to side? Up and down. Exactly right. <laughs> Long after that childhood epiphany, Bibbit can now be found performing his own yes, handkerchief true. tricks Sometimes at the Andersonville Lounge that aims to Watch recreate the, the spirit of Chicago-style close-up magic. A lot of people say, you know, Chicago-style magic is close-up magic, and it is, but we didn't invent close-up magic. What we did was invent where close-up magic was performed. Where it was performed was the Neighborhood Tavern. Chicago Magic Lounge co-owner and CEO Joey Cranford says Chicago-style bar magic was perfected in neighborhood spots like Shulian's, where the legendary Matt Shulian began entertaining patrons in his father's bar with close-up magic as a young man in the 1910s. He just really started fooling everybody. And it was, it, what was really different about it was that it was funny, it was fast, it was a little crude, and it was in a bar, and that's what made it different. It was adult themed over drinks. You can watch magic and drink like that was that was it. By the 60s, magic bars like Shulian's were all over Chicago. The New York Lounge, the Ivanhoe, little bit of magic. But tastes and entertainment changed over the years and the magic bars slowly vanished. Still, Cranford kept the flame alive. In 2015, he developed a magic show for an uptown burlesque theater that showcased Chicago-style magic. As the show grew, Cranford's ideas got bigger, too. I wanted to uh, come up with kind of a theatrical version of a night at a magic bar, um, an amalgamation of all of the bars combined into one. Cranford found a home for his vision in this building, which now winks at its past life as a commercial laundry. Unlike private magic clubs in other cities, anyone can stop into the magic lounge for a cocktail with a dash of deceit. Well, if they could figure out how to get inside. We wanted you to have an experience that would take you in and make you wonder what's going on every step of the way. We wanted it to be hard to find. We wanted to throw misdirection at you from the beginning. Inside, a library of vintage magic books lines the walls and a collection of historic ephemera pays homage to the old magic days. We have uh, Don Allen's dice cup that he used. Don Allen had a TV show in Chicago called The Magic Ranch. While magicians like Bibbick dazzle drinkers from behind the bar. I am the amazing Bibbick. It's time for a little bit of bar magic here tonight. That's impressive right there, isn't it? That's for good stuff. If you're not careful, they go everywhere. A second secret entrance leads to a 120-seat theater where strolling magicians perform tricks tableside before featured entertainers like Gozner take the stage. I try to go really slow. Uh, I don't like to go so fast, so I love the magic to be so clear. So if I show you the cards, you're pretty sure if I show you the 10, can make a, an eight, something like that, really slow and really clear. Entertainment director Benjamin Barnes says that there's more to finding the right kind of magicians than meets the eye. I'm not looking just for someone who's doing a card trick, but someone who has that personality that connects with the people who come in and hopefully can give them something that they've never experienced before. And though the Chicago Magic Lounge was created with a modern sensibility, Cranford says the magic of the city's past informs and inspires it. New York Lounge had a motto, and it was painted on the side of their building. It's fun to be fooled. We're not here to make you mad. We're not here to challenge you with some puzzle you can't figure out. We're here to just fool you. <laughs> and it's fun, fun to be fooled. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And we reveal more about the Chicago Magic Lounge on our website. There, before we go, some viewer feedback. There was strong reaction so, to uh, Cardinal Supergy's stance uh, yeah, on this. I would just suggest that the Attorney General stay in his lane. The Cardinal took Attorney General Jeff Sessions to task for using the Bible to justify administration policy, ending his explanation with this. Here's what some of you had to say about it. 
I like the Cardinals, uh, I like the card, excuse me, I like the Cardinals stay in his own lane comment that was a fairly diplomatic and appropriate response. So the Catholic establishment is again trying to dictate public policy. Time to end the tax exempt status of these socialists living in a fantasy bubble world. Are they still getting free Chicago water? Cardinal tells Sessions to shut up and dribble. Where's your outrage at the corrupt countries from which these people flee? Very wise, it's nice to finally have a bishop who supports Christian values. He is still a minority among American bishops. The law is just. These parents are voluntarily putting their children in harm's way by breaking the just law of the U.S. They're to protect our borders, as the Bible also allows nations to do. The illegal aliens need to come to the proper entry points to enter. As always, we appreciate hearing from you. Join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter or post your comments on our website. And that is our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily e-alert. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. The Supreme Court is finally expected to rule on an Illinois case that could weaken public employee unions. And as Vienna Beef turns 125 years, we get a peek behind the curtain to see how the sausage is made. Now for all of us here at Chicago tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, proud sponsors of the Illinois Bar Foundation, which raises money to enhance the availability of justice for those without attorneys throughout the state.